Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The movie we're showing today, Rhapsody in Blue, is the last in our musical series for this spring. Not that another musical may not show itself, it will during the course of all these coming years. But for right now, in May of 2023, with the beauties of springtime, I decided to forego my usual habit of showing a veteran's picture in May and one in November. There are so many movies to be shown, so many veterans to honor, that this time we will take a pass on that and have a November movie that's appropriate for veterans viewing and honoring. At the same time as we leave the story today, I want to honor our veterans just to all in one, take a moment to have all of them stand as a group that are in the audience of any military service in our United States government, in any war, any action, or behind any desk. Would all those who are veterans please rise for our approval. And thanks. We love you. And now we go on, wait for your November film, but there is a little bit here and there and on Moonlight Bay of the military, so we'll leave it at that and show one veterans movie per year rather than two from here on. We have so many genres to cover. So bear with me, Rhapsody in Blue was produced in 1945, also by Warner Brothers, as I recall. This is the story of stars Robert Alda as George Gershwin, Charles Coburn as his friend and musical agent, and Joan Leslie as his love interest. Joan Leslie is a particular interest because she also starred in the same role in Yankee Doodle Dandy as James Cagney's sweetheart. They have in common that both of those, I've shown the other one before, we're showing Rhapsody in Blue today, are biographies of great songwriters. A biography of a songwriter, Jack Warner learned, was as good as gold. You owned all the rights already, or could buy them up rather cheaply at that time, and then you made your movie, and did they make scads of money? Rhapsody in Blue, Gershwin was so popular, he died at age 37. So this talks about all of his works leading up to the finale, which just ends with a full performance of Rhapsody in Blue, performed by the great Oscar Levant, pianist of Gene Kelly movies. So here he was doing this movie as a favor also because he was a personal friend of Gershwin's. So it's in the movie, and then he appears to play. He plays the piano at the end. Some of the others have to appear to play a little like Robert Alda. They kind of have to fake it. But when you hear the voice, I'm told, for many of these, and the uh, singing voice is George Gershwin himself recorded. So you can see his playing, you know, his attempt at a few lyrics, and other people singing. Of course, he had those wonderful songs like Embraceable Beauty that were not in Porgy and Bess, the whole opera. I don't need to regale you with a list of George Gershwin, sometimes called America's second and third foremost composer, usually after Aaron Copeland. At any rate, here we have a couple of them. Here we are with Rhapsody in Blue telling the story. So we get Joan Leslie as a counterpart. We know the genre. Even if it's black and white, which most musicals were, again, they wanted the con, it wasn't for budget. They wanted a contrast. Black and white can do things that color can't. It can show you shades of meaning. It can show you different. Color can do many things. And as you watch, why do I watch a black and white movie? Reality was never black and white, except that it often is in the choices we make. In the choices we make, even Bob Dylan. And black and white and right and wrong, I combine those terms somehow. Ah, but I was so much older then. I'm a younger than that now. So we begin to learn that black and white is a way of life. And unfortunately, in some unfortunate ways, which are not appropriate right here, but always appropriate to never forget, black and white has become symbolic. And they thought they would do it not for that reason, but because they wanted the story to be told in a shade of somber gray. But even for that, with the wonderful music, it, it permeates the movie, and especially Rhapsody in Blue at the end will be thrilled. Those who like American classical movies, music, will think Rhapsody in Blue one of the best they've ever seen. It's a wonderful orchestral arrangement. 
following that, of course, the other two things to look for, besides the Gershwin similarities, the music, Joan Leslie, the second thing I would say is for a musical, some are better than others, this has pretty good acting. Robert Alda is every bit convincing. Charles Coburn is always a delightful presence. Jolly man like Cuddle Sakal. Big man, he won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor a year or two before or after in a film called The More Than Area. And he brightened many a movies down to his last that I know of, Around the World in 80 Days. And his second to the last, a kindly millionaire uncle and gentleman prefer, gentlemen prefer blogs with Marilyn Monroe and Jane Russell. So Charles Coburn was always a face that audiences wanted to see coming. Joan Leslie was beautiful. She had played for Warner Brothers Gary Cooper's love interest in an ultimate wife in Sergeant York, which was nominated for Best Picture and for which Coop won the Best Actor Award for the nominee for Oscar. Then we move on to later she made this wonderful movie. Yeah, she made the wonderful one about Yankee Doodle Dandy. She was a star at Warner Brothers and then something happened to Joe Leslie that really shouldn't have happened. The studio system was all prevalent at that time. She was dissatisfied, not with her parts, but with her salary at Warner Brothers, pointing out at that time that she was equally important to the story, but earning less than a third of Cagney's salary and not as much as Charles Coburn. They didn't like it. They said, you're doing great, stay in line. You know, you're just a cranky woman. So what did she do? She left Warner Brothers. It caused a big furor and a lawsuit in Hollywood, which she ultimately prevailed. But her name was not blacklisted as in communist. It was sort of lowballed because she couldn't get very much work because they say, well, look what she did to Warner Brothers. You see, we don't want to end up in a lawsuit. So she made one movie, The Revolt of Mamie Stover, a supporting part, and, oh, I don't know, about 52 or 3 with Jane Russell, and then Joan Leslie, who's worth talking about a minute, went into a long decline in her period of movies. Joan Leslie then played in whatever movie work she could get. The Woman They Almost Lynched, a Western for Republic. Man in the Saddle, a Western for, with Randolph Scott for Columbia. In every one of these low-budget movies, she was about the best actor involved. She was way above her way below her pay grade and way below her ability, but she was well above her ability to handle the part. So we have everything we need to know about this one, I think. It's Joan Leslie, Robert Alda, and the acting, the musical performance, the desire they used to have in Hollywood to make educational movies. This really sold to schools later in 16 millimeter. You know, music classes, composition classes, you could rent it, you could buy it for your school library on old 16 millimeter stock. You could have this. And they had a lot of those movies like, oh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, Yankee Doodle Dandy, which in their own way tried to tell American history and American songwriting and British history and British Julius Caesar. You get the idea. We'll be back now to the world of George Gershwin, Rhapsody of Blue.